When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. Hello, all right, all right, all right. I'm doing the Matthew McConaughey opening here uh, for our uh, vlogcast, uh, our weekly event where we try and let you know what we feel is going on. Of course, uh, yeah. what's really going on is uh, next week uh, we are going to be doing a vlogcast because we're going to be doing a top 15. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be of the uh, Christmas films, top 15 Christmas films or specials mm -hmm. that we feel should get some spotlight. They don't get enough love, and uh, they really should get some of the love that the classics do. Now, of course, defining classics is slightly arbitrary. We'll try our best to be Yeah, we're trying to stay away it. from the super popular ones. Like yeah. uh, the uh, Ernest Goes to Christmas, or the Aww. National Lampoons, or the White Christmases, or Miracle the on National 34th Lampoons Street. Is. I don't know that I would count the second one as... Uh... Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> I put that on the top 15 list anyway. <laughs> uh, so what have you been watching this week? Uh, well, there's been a little bit, but not a huge amount. And I feel like I've probably forgotten some of it, to be honest. Um... Mostly I have been doing ongoing viewing, uh, worked on a good, you know, good, a good chunk more of uh, CSI and Friends and particularly Chihai of Huru. I've been watching the heck out of that one. <laughs> and um, I have been working on my project for Criterion. I've been uh, trying to... Uh, since I ended up watching Princess Bride right away, which I hadn't really planned to, but I did, uh, I started looking at the bonus features. And a couple nights ago, I watched hmm. a very interesting one where um, they have a bonus feature where Rob Reiner, the director of the film, yeah. uh, reads from an audiobook of William Goldman's novel, The Princess Bride, and they play. They actually play the movie with the soundtrack muted and Reiner reading over it, and he's reading a heavily abridged version of the story that largely syncs up with the movie, but not entirely. I think with some slightly better editing on the syncing of the story, they could have been awesome, but it's still a pretty cool bonus feature, and it really gives you a feel for some of the changes that happened. Um... So yeah. that's yeah, that's that's my main ongoing watching. Um, one ongoing reading is I read several volumes of Guardians of the Galaxy, which supposedly ended Brian Michael Bendis's run on the series, and his run on the series was pretty awesome, and it goes out on a pretty high note, and I like that. It was good times. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yeah, well, that's like I said. Mostly, I've got finished stuff. Or watch stuff. Well, I mean, right now I've been trying to play a little bit more Fallout 76, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to put it on hold for a little while. Um, I'm either getting killed off. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing because every time I hear it, it's like it's near impossible for players to kill you off, but somehow I keep getting snuck up on and killed by another player. <laughs> so I'm waiting until the 4th uh, <laughs> where they're going to do a big update on it. <laughs> so it's... I guess uh, we've already passed it. Okay, well, uh, then, then that's good. Uh, maybe I'll try again. Um, but mainly I've been concentrating on Fallout 4, which also has some very bad frame rate drops, but mm. I'm mostly done with the uh, Far Harbor uh, story, and I'm hoping to get to where I can actually beat the game for once. Mm -hmm. I have yet to beat Fallout 4, because like any Bethesda title... You don't beat Bethesda titles. You just walk off the beaten path and just do random crap in the huge sandbox world that they have created for you <laughs> to tool around in. All righty then. Um, I have started Our Home's Fox Deity, which is the oh. next uh, of the NIS titles. Nice. I'm hoping to end part one 
of the two parts, and uh, then probably launch into my Christmas watching. And my plans are to get at least two reviews out, uh, but uh, maybe <laughs> more. I'm trying to watch Christmas Cruelty, Mother Krampus 2, Bad Santa 2, and The Hebrew Hammer, <laughs> as well as that one, uh, the uh, Charles Dickens one, um, The Man Who Invented Christmas. I need to see that. So that's my intent, but we'll see if I actually get through any of it. I do definitely want to do Christmas Cruelty. That'll be my 300th review. Mm. But the one that I'm watching right now uh, that I find uh, really interesting and I wanted to chat about just for a moment is the Shira remake. Mm. Anybody uh, here probably who has grown up in the 80s uh, probably was familiar with He-Man. Mm -hmm. If you're a boy, and Shira if you were a girl. <laughs> because they made them very well in those defined lines. <laughs> I watched both, but that's because I really thought that some of the villains were much cooler in She-Ra than they were in He-Man. Though I was much more in line with the really manly uh, heroes like in He-Man. And they man, all man, had the man, same... Man, all the females man, had the same man. body type, and all the males had the same body type as other males. And it was just really... I can say, and, it, and I think it was just to sell the action figures. Yeah, the action figures were a big part of it. As was the case with quite a few of those 80s programs. So I had my <laughs> doubts with it when, when Thundercats, their, their new remake, mm -hmm. turned out to be the Teen Titans Go of Thundercats. <laughs> <clears throat> Making fun of it more than it was actually, you know, uh huh. Uh, doing anything but this one actually reminds me a lot of avatar the last airbender the the show <laughs> i was gonna say mm, you're talking about remakes and... <laughs> but uh the animation is pretty smooth oh. the character design is not bad and it is a very well done show i've really enjoyed the writing uh mm -hmm. and the character definition and for those of you who it is a very important to have people of all races, colors, and genders uh, in there, they are very good at having a varied race selection of people. One of the characters is questionable and maybe even LGBT in his uh, in his leanings. And uh, one of the main female characters is not it has the actual uh, more. Um, What's the word? More realistic female build. Hmm. So, uh, very, very interesting. Hmm. Good times. Yeah. Uh, the you got to get through the first two episodes. Yeah, I thought maybe this might be too girly for me. But then after the third or fourth episode, uh, I gave it another chance after episode three and was pulled in pretty well with the story and uh, the designs. If you can survive the se first season of... Uh... My Little Pony, you can survive anything. Yeah, but I haven't watched it <laughs> since the first season. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is too girly for me. <laughs> it's ridiculously serious. Instant diabetes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you look like you had something that came to your mind there when we were talking. Oh, no, I just remembered what one of those auctions I lost was. The one that was close to 100 yeah. had all three seasons of Avatar. Oh. Or, or all three of the books, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, you got yeah. a, you get pretty good deals on getting the whole series on Blu-ray these days. You can yeah, get all of it for like twenty-eight to yeah. thirty, so it's not bad. No, no, not bad at all. The the um, yeah. So I had a couple of things that were completed or watched. Um, we covered one of them last week on Inside Movies Galore. <sighs> <laughs> Death chasm. Um, anyway, on the far opposite, well, I won't, no, I'll be fair, not the far opposite end of the scale, but decidedly higher on my personal scale for viewing. Last night, I had the opportunity to see one of this summer's more talked about films, although not necessarily a huge hit of the summer. But it was a really interesting film called Sorry to Bother You. Oh, yeah. And it kind of centers on this dude who's played by Lakeith Stanfeld, who has um, pretty much a ne'er-do-well, 
No, he should. The movie starts with him in a job interview where he has brought in a plaque of an employee of the month plaque because, yes, people are allowed to keep those plaques. <laughs> and he has brought in a trophy that he supposedly earned. And he's doing this interview with this guy. And the guy's like, well, you know what? He reads off the experience that was listed. He's like, and, and the one where he said he was employee of the month, he's like, you know what? I was manager at that bank for during these years, and I have never seen you before. <laughs> but he ends up giving him the job because he appreciates his in, his uh, incentive. His um, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? He's uh, a real go getter. He's a go getter, exactly. <laughs> so it's a job in a call center, and the film is it takes liberties. Let's put it that way. It's not. It definitely gets into a very satirical realm. It Stuff happens that really gets weirder and weirder. But I'm not going to say really what happens too much because that spoils some of the fun. But basically this guy, he's working a crap job in a call center. He makes friends, well his his buddy has, is also working in the call center. And there's this other dude who's an agitator who wants to unionize them. And his girlfriend is played by Tessa Thompson, who's rapidly becoming one of my favorites. She's she's pretty awesome. Uh, she kicked ass in Thor Ragnarok. But right. she, yeah, but um, she plays his very uh, liberal, opinionated girlfriend, who's like a performance artist. And she gets involved in the union because why not? Yeah. And he to break the union. Well, again, I'm not going to say what they do, but anyway. Um, the film also features a subplot of this worry-free company that his girlfriend's like, this is just slave labor. Well, you know, and, and really it looks like it is. It's like they're like, you sign a lifetime contract, you're not paid, but you're given housing and food and employment and, <laughs> you know. And the guy running it is this guy who, he seems like this total cult leader type. He's played by Army Hammer. And Hammer doesn't have a big role until late in the film. And when he, I, I liked him in this movie. The <laughs> things that he, I mean, not his character, but the way he performed this role where he is saying these awful things and he's totally earnest about it and totally, he, he totally sells the role. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I like that. I was actually <laughs> laughing because it was so awful and so wrong. And I was like, oh my God, they, I, I can't believe it. Uh, and there's one part where they really dive headlong into the racial stereotype part of it. And that was uncomfortably funny, but it was... <laughs> but it's a good movie. It's worth watching. There's a lot of language. There's some really cheesy special effects. But they detract slightly later in the movie. But there, there are special effects that come into play. Uh, it was interesting. It was not quite what I expected, but it was interesting. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen much this week. Uh, mm -hmm. I've only got two entries hmm. for seeing. Uh, one of them you talked about last week, which was Hotel Transylvania 3. Ah. I had to watch it. I mean, we recently yeah. went on a cruise, and they mm -hmm. went on a cruise, mm -hmm. and I saw part of it on our cruise. <laughs> And it really was sad. Um, I was picking up hamburgers at the uh, Johnny Rockets on board. Right. And uh, I was watching it under the stars because I thought it was cool. But I had to leave because I had to deliver the hamburgers to the <laughs> room for my wife. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you value your I kept life. Wanting, I kept wanting her to go, come on, let's go up. I like, no, no, I want to stay in the room. Let's stay in the room. Like, ah. We missed it. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. I, I liked the characterizations. I really think that the uh, Dracula character is probably one of Adam Sandler's more likable characters. Oh, he's very likable. He really is. He's almost... And he's not very Adam Sandler-like. Maybe that's why. He's, <laughs> but uh, he, he is a fun character. Yeah. Uh, I really did enjoy it. And uh, the shorts, I admit one of them I wish I had watched before uh, the movie. 
Um, or puppy? Yeah, puppy. So that I as, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. Uh, if you haven't mm-hmm. seen it yet, check mm-hmm. it out. Don't pay a lot for it. I didn't pay a lot for it, so I came really, <laughs> really close to getting that one for post Black Friday sales, and I decided against it. I guess next year, but we'll see. I'll regret probably not getting it for the price of all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the last thing I have for this week was my reading. And I finished reading John Grisham's new book, The Reckoning. And it's a strange book for him because it's historical fiction, which I don't know if I've read any of his that really are. A lot of his are steeped in the history of whatever area he's writing about or, or whatever, um, particularly if it's set in... Um, Seems to be particularly if it's said in Mississippi, because that's where he's done a lot of his, you know, yeah. he spent a lot of time in Mississippi. And supposedly this book was was inspired by an anecdote he heard about a man who killed, a prominent man killed another prominent man and went to the, and was hanged for it without ever saying why he did it. And that's the the basic gist of the novel. It's a little different. He gets electrocuted. But Pete Banning shoots and kills the local preacher, Dexter Bell, and won't say why. He just simply says, I have nothing to say. He allows himself to be tried. He, His lawyers would rather do anything else than the position they're put in. <laughs> his family is destroyed he he destroys everything and won't say why. And this third part, second part, goes back to the Philippines where he had been a soldier. And it's an historical drama set during the, Phil- the World War II in the Philippines. And the third part brings it back to Mississippi and it focuses more on the family and what's left over. It was interesting it was a little bit uneven for his books it was a quick read and it was fun and i liked it but it was not his strongest book but worth looking at yeah hey, they're all worth looking at at one point yeah. <laughs> and then one thing i will say is like i finished it i read this on the tail of it it is a much better book and stephen king in general is a better writer than john grisham but stephen king in general is a denser writer than John Grisham. They're both really good at writing books that are compulsively readable, but King's books take longer. I don't know if anyone else, if everyone would agree with me on that, but The Reckoning is like 415 pages. It's a little bit more than a third of the length of it. And I finished it in less than a week, and it took me well over a month. And it's just, if I were to look at it page per page, it took longer to read. Just, that's the way it is when you're, you know, so it's one reason I like Grisham, because he's a quick read, but... <laughs> you, know the, you know, it's weird, with the title of that book, the mm-hmm. way that you phrased that sounded very weird. What? You finished it in a week. Though it took you, though it took nope. you over a month to read. No, nope. yeah, I know what you mean, but it's what sounded yeah. like. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it, it is. Uh, it's That's like one a, of the fun things about it is you can't. What was it? You, you um, I just said it. I said just said it. <laughs> <Damn>! <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can't very well get oil without saying is, can you? <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> For me, the last thing I got through was I finished Pandora Hearts. Ah. Uh, it is an interesting series, though a very dark one, so I'm kind of glad that Our Home's Fox Deity is following it up. Uh, it's about this noble who uh, just comes of age, and he manages mm. to move this unstoppable clock, showing that he is one of the chosen ones. Unfortunately, that triggers some people who decide that he needs to be sent to hell. Yeah. So he goes to hell... And he hooks up with one, and he does a contract with this demon. And the demons in this universe are called Chains. Mm-hmm. And he manages to claw his way out of the abyss and join this group called the uh, Pandora. It's called and, Pandora. And the contract is an incurse, right? Or yeah. is that the name of the, the clock that uh, I can't remember? And the clock is related to the contract. 
Yeah. And if the clock goes, once the clock goes a full cycle, you're dragged down yeah. to the deepest part of the abyss. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to ruin what happens uh, throughout, but uh, the idea is that he's helping this one chain specifically, mm-hmm. known as Bee Rabbit or Alice, depending on which way you want to look at her, mm-hmm. and tries to find the mysteries behind this particular uh, uh, this particular thing about what happened so long ago, where almost an entire city block fell into the abyss. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting about this is, much like Skip Beat, this one also ends before ending it. You have a lot of stuff unresolved. Mm-hmm. But it, but unlike Skip Beat, you feel more like it was a true like way of ending it. I could put it down and maybe pick it up later if I feel like reading the manga. With mm-hmm. Skip Beat... I pretty much had to go directly to uh, reading the manga. <laughs> now, see, both of these are series where I've been tried to be familiar with the manga, but whereas Skip Beat is compulsively readable and I love reading it, Pandora Hearts, uh, I have slogged through about nine volumes. I can't even uh-huh. remember how <laughs> far I am. I'll pick up a volume read it half-heartedly, and a month later I'll try and figure out where I am in the series. And maybe if I were just to sit down and read it, but it's like I was telling him, the character designs, some of the characters look identical to each other. So if you're not reading it all the way through, you lose track. And it's just, it's weird. But um, I am hoping the show's better. And I do like the some of the aspects of it. I liked so. Well, very yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, it is a riff on Alice in Wonderland. Alice, of course, being one of the main characters, mm-hmm. but think more like American McGee's Alice and less of the more traditional uh, version. <laughs> well, since you've got a little bit more news than I do, I would. Yeah. Uh, you can go ahead and start us off. I don't want much, but the big one this week for me, at least. The big one, or the big fun one, because there was some big news this week that was not as fun. But the big fun one, Netflix has apparently ordered a 10-episode live-action version of Cowboy Bebop, where they will have original series creator Shinichiro Watanabe as consultant on the series. And Keanu Reeves as Spike. No, just kidding. (laughs) Well, no, I was getting ready to say... And the announcement made no mention of Keanu Reeves. (laughs) Now, I will say this. I don't mind Keanu being involved because I know he is passionate about the project. But no spike. No spike for you. No. If he wants to be on board as a producer or something, I'm fine with that. What nationality is Spike? Because they're all different nationalities. I don't think it matters. Cowboy Bebop is one... Faye looks Asian, and so if she's played by Asian, I'll be happier. But, um, and Edward, of course, is, uh, she's like Indian or something, isn't she? But I think Jet and Spike could be pretty much anything, and I'd be fine with it. Um, but they, I mean, it's set in space, so you get a lot of leeway there. But the only thing that has me worried, the only things that have me worried... One, we don't have the best track record of adapting anime to Americanized productions. And two, this is a show that's going to be very effects heavy if they do it right. It's going to have to be very effects heavy. So that could work either for or against it, depending on how they do it. (laughs) But I want to see it. (laughs) The only thing that matters is that they get my favorite character, Ayn, correct. Yeah, I was thinking about that because the music is another thing that matters because oh, yeah. music is a huge part of this. That's a I was thinking they could do like as one of like the house band and one of the bars they go to or something yeah. could be Hot Club of Cowtown because they tour with a little corgi that looks just like <laughs> I'm and it's a very well behaved dog. <laughs> there could, you go. Maybe that dog could play I'm. I don't know. I just want to see the scene where he he gets high on mushrooms. <laughs> oh, I wonder if they'll do the Toys in the Attic episode with the killer lobster. Or, or, <laughs> d- yeah. So uh, I've got friends. I mean, not friends. I've got uh, Netflix news actually yeah. about Friends. Ah. they are pulling Friends from their lineup. 
Oh. In January. So if you want to get your friend's groove on... You must gonna, be thrilled. You'll have to get it elsewhere. I, I don't care, though Netflix is spending 500000 an episode for it. What? So I, I don't blame them for pulling. Like... On a regular basis, or how? I don't know what the uh, I don't know what the th- I think it's uh, they had to spend that much to have the whole series for uh, like their term, hmm. and now they have to renew it. And I can understand them uh, going, yeah, no, yeah. I mean that's that's a lot. That is a lot, lot of money. Uh, so you know, like I said, get your friends groove on elsewhere. Uh, though, tell you the truth, get the physical media if you yeah. really want it. It's not that expensive for the whole series, and no, I do not have it. Yes, um, you don't have to pay five hundred thousand to own the show. The um, and wasn't it when it was on the air that was like the most expensive show on TV or or close to it? It got to it at the end because yeah, cause all the were... actors and actresses were yeah. charging so yeah. much. And NBC was paying out the wazoo between that and uh, Frasier and ER. That was during their heyday, though. That was like when they were at the top. True. Um, Speaking of Netflix losing stuff, one of the big news items this week, which is one of the more depressing ones, is Netflix has officially given Daredevil the axe. They, after three seasons, and apparently season three was the best ever, um, they have said that, yeah, the, the Daredevil is done. They had already canceled two of their series, so even though there's no news yet about Jessica Jones and Punisher, the Something writing coming. is on the wall at this point. And this, uh, yeah. new news has surfaced hmm? that Disney is looking to possibly re uh, have them show up yeah. in their stream, which... Yeah. Seems to me kind of an eerie coincidence, but since yeah. Disney has stated that they do not want anything that is that is above, that's higher yeah. rated than G on their streaming service. I do not think Disney is going to touch Frank Castle. He is done. Yeah. He is done. But they will probably. I think there will be ways, easily ways, for them to incorporate Daredevil, probably Luke Cage. You know, some of these characters. Daredevil in particular, they can easily incorporate him into the Disney fold, but they it's pretty much a given that they're probably going to recast, which is a shame because Charlie Cox is a oh, fine actor. And, never mind, yeah. it's not only G, it's, it's it's no R. Okay, so yeah, uh, so they could deal with that. They could yeah, G rated. What are you talking about? There, there had been talks originally that Disney was originally thinking that they could just have only G rated material for their streaming. Yeah, right. Okay. Which would be, uh, which would probably have ended most of it. Why would you bother would even you bring that? the Marvel yeah. stuff there? But uh, they you can't got, do that. They got a lot of interesting Star Wars stuff and such lined up. Well, even Star Wars couldn't be oh, no, G rated. Yeah, PG. So PG PG thirteen is going to be the highest that Disney is going to go okay. with their streaming. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of those Marvel Net- Netflix shows came very close. Right. But I'm pretty sure that Disney has a hand right. in these cancellations. Right. They want all the toys. Of course they do. <sighs> but uh, I do have some more interesting uh, news here. Um, video game news. Mm. Red Dead Redemption 2 is, of course, doing very well. And they launched their online servers mm. today. Which they had. Uh, they, which came with a broken economy basically um you could you could get a wedding uh, a gold wedding ring Mm -hmm. and sell that wedding ring and get less for that than it cost to buy a can of baked beans in that universe not only that but you're getting like five cents uh or ten cents a mission Mm -hmm. but all the items are costing like five and ten bucks (laughs) And even more in some aspects. Yeah. Some things are cost upwards of a thousand bucks. Hmm. So, why are they doing that? You might think. Me, I believe that they are going. They're doing that so that they can introduce their own version of shark cards. For those of you not familiar, in GTA Five Online, shark cards are a way of buying in-game money with real money. Mm-hmm. And they're setting it up so that they can force you, the player, 
to spend real money if you want to do anything. Buy ammo, have food, do anything in the online universe. Yeah, that's stupid. It's just the way that they're trying to do things these days. Right. Some people have complained and they address the complaints with, well, work harder. Yeah, and you can address that with, oh, no, I think I'll do something else with my time. And this does come free with the game, and from mm. what people tell me, the single-player experience in Red Dead 2 is an amazing thing to behold. Mm. Me, I have not played Red Dead 1, so I yeah. don't know. But I am curious. I haven't either. <laughs> okay, well, on rather more somber news, you may have noticed that we did not do um, our usual tribute to those of past this week, Partly because, I want to be honest, I got I had a busy weekend. And I just, it's another reason why I haven't, didn't have a huge amount of viewing to, to report. I had a busy, busy weekend. And I just didn't even, it just didn't happen. So I think next week I'm going to include some people from the past week and do like a two thing. Uh, I do apologize about that, but I did want to make note of a couple of really notable ones that passed this week. Um, one of the, uh, well, I guess we'll lead off with probably the biggest one to most people, even though this is outside the world of entertainment. I'd be remiss if I did not m mention the former president, George H.W. Bush. You know, that was a pretty big, <laughs> yeah, big <laughs> event. Guy. That's a, yes. And, um... The other, but as far as your more uh, entertainment-related ones, two big ones. Steven Hillenburg, the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. Actually, that's a big deal for a lot of people, so <laughs> that he is worth noting. And the other one, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, the famed director who did the uh, Oscar... Uh, big Oscar movie from 87, I believe it was, The Last Emperor, which was a really good movie, really, really uh, quality one. Um, he died right at the start of the week, like right at the beginning. Um, so those were the big ones that come to mind, and like I said, I wanted to give them a, a little bit of a, you know, a, a nod um, just to... Unfortunately, like I said, we didn't do our usual thing. But yeah. um, the uh, Bertolucci, I mean, again, uh, there's some influence there on, on any number of, of filmmakers. And um, the, uh, yeah, there's that one. <laughs> well, I don't have much else to uh, discuss on this. I got one more that uh, Inside Movies Galore did interview somebody who is mm. a, uh, somewhat of a friend to this channel, mm. Kyle Rappaport. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, was in such films. Uh, he was in the film um, Camp Blood Seven. Mm. He also had. Uh, he also is in a couple of trauma pieces like Return to Newcomb High, Volume mm -hmm. One and Two, and will be in Shakespeare's Shitstorm. So it's a worthwhile. Uh, it is a worthwhile uh, interview to check out. I have checked it out myself. So mm -hmm. uh, get on over to our friend site, Inside Movies Galore, and mm -hmm. check that that bad boy out. Okay. We're also heading up for the Christmas season. If you have not watched it already, you need to check out our discussion on Black Christmas. Ooh. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. We're, we've got a big old Christmas schedule. We're going to be covering yep. some major classics, and not all of them horror, believe it or not. Yes, we actually, after this one, we have, we'll be taking a couple weeks off. But we will also, the next three on the docket are not horror movies. Now, I'm not going to ruin it for any yes. of y'all, but uh, they're two comedies and an action movie after the first of the year. Yes. So get ready for some fun yep. and some variety. We've got a horror, yep. two comedies, and an action Ooh. coming up. Um, yeah. And this horror movie is considered to be possibly the birth of the traditional slasher film. Yes. So, it would be worth seeing. Good times. Well, we had a short one this week, but uh, we oh, do intend... I, I still oh. got a couple more. Oh, you got more? Yeah, I got a couple more. Well, what you be to go for it? Well, <laughs> uh, speaking of horror, um, the recent Stephen King book, The Outsider, has been picked up as a TV series. 
And Ben Mendelsohn is going to star in it. And uh, apparently Jason Bateman, I think, is on board as a producer. So looking forward to that. Uh, Mirai of the Future, the, the new film from Mamoru Hosoda, which I hopefully will have seen by the time this posts. Uh, and MFKZ are both being nominated for Annie's. So that's cool. Uh, and then the big one. Uh, uh, the other big one. <laughs> From the world of literature, the big announcement of the week. Margaret Atwood is finally, um, I think, what is it, 84, 94... I can't do math right now. 35 years, I think, 34 years after the fact is writing a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which will be coming out next year. And no, it is not related to the TV show. It's a sequel to the original novel. No so, one's interested in that. I am. <laughs> they don't want to know what the TV series sequel is. Well, you can read the books while you wait to find out where the show's going. <laughs> and the first book is quite good, so I am looking forward to the sequel. But, yeah, that was, that, that's the rest of my news. So. <laughs> All right, so if that's it, then we are, um, well, done for this time around. All right. Uh, got a short one this time around. Yes. But uh, I look forward to working with y'all in the holidays. Mm -hmm. Like I said, next week, no vlogcast. But then we should have plenty to come back on the following week and before Christmas. And we'll have Christmas. a cool top 15 in its place. Exactly. Yes. So check that out. And I hope you enjoyed this vlogcast. All right. Comment, subscribe, and share. Hi. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.